Good afternoon. So my name's Helen Cooney, and uh, I used to work in maternal mental health and ADHD for about 17 years. Now I've moved my job to not working for me. Okay. Now I've moved my job out to uh, Furunaki in County's Manukau. And the interesting thing working out there, an interesting statistic, is that going on from what we've been hearing today about family violence, there has been a study in Australia which showed that 45% of the mental health issues in uh, children and adolescents wouldn't occur if there wasn't abuse and neglect. Isn't it amazing? So the slides that I've got today were largely put together by Chandani Prakash, who's a psychiatrist at Maternal Mental Health in, uh, at Green Lane. Uh, so I want to acknowledge her. On the far um, screen, there's the Maternal Mental Health team at Counties Manukau. And they're actually, they have to, they have to keep like this to, to um, bear the sort of work that we do. So it's really important to have downtime and to look after ourselves and to talk about the stressful stuff. So that's the stuff that you need to know about uh, referrals to counties Manukau and how to get in touch with us. Um, all of the referrals go through a central <coughs> clearing house, which we call intake and assessment. But we send along people from the maternal mental health team every day to make sure that your referrals are getting through. Of course you can. So it's a yes to e-referrals. Okay. So we're going to actually have to do a pretty quick uh, whiz through some of this stuff. So bear with me. This is my understanding of the sorts of things we're going to be talking about today. And I also understand that it's got to be really practical. So we're not going to do a case. Um, with this slide, what I want you to take away from it is that uh, if somebody comes into your office with bipolar mood disorder, we would appreciate a referral because it's so important to keep these people well. Okay. Now I'm sure that you all know about the postpartum blues, postnatal depression and postpartum psychosis and the differences and that sort of stuff. With the anxiety disorders, my understanding is that general practice deals a lot with a lot of this stuff all the time. Okay? We get the really severe stuff referred to us. Okay? I want to talk about, a bit about depression in pregnancy in that it's really important that it's recognised. Um, the important statistic there is that uh, there's a prevalence a large prevalence in Tongan women, and they don't necessarily talk about it. Okay. With postnatal depression, we all know that it's common, um, and what we see in mental health is that if it doesn't get picked up first time round, it doesn't just go away. We may well see a woman with subsequent pregnancies and she's still depressed. And so we've got to think. What has that done to the development of the first child? And so if it's severe, it requires treatment by a specialist service. Antidepressants are often required if it's severe. We've got to think about risks of suicide and risks to the baby. Now, um, this woman looks pregnant rather than postpartum to me, but uh, the symptoms are much the same. With the pregnant women, you can't rely on what I call the biological syndrome. So the tiredness, the poor sleep, the appetite, 
changes that we all understand about depression. You more have to go by the cognitive changes. So she's worried she's not going to be sleeping very well, but you know, is that to do with the fact that she's got to get up several times during the night? So the cognitive changes are going to be uh, that she's not really excited about the baby, she's worried that she's not going to cope, you know, her thoughts about it all. So with postpartum depression, the lack of enjoyment with the baby is really important because this is going to affect her attachment. She generally won't be able to sleep. I shouldn't say her attachment, I should say her bonding and the baby's attachment with her. There'll be the guilty feelings that, uh, you know, she's no good as a parent. And sometimes there's these intrusive thoughts about harming the baby. Okay. So let's go back to a pregnant woman being depressed. These are the risks of, of the depression not being treated. So low birth weight, preterm birth. It's generally not hugely preterm, but it does shorten the pregnancy smaller head circumference, um, poor self-care. These people often don't uh, go along to their midwives until late. They're more likely to smoke, use alcohol, drugs. And the children are more likely to have behavioral problems, developmental delays. Basically, this slide is saying that if a woman has depression and it's treated and she stops her medication during pregnancy, there's quite a high risk of relapse. Also, there's a quite a high risk of relapse even if she stays on her medication. So that means that we really need to be looking at all the social determinants of, you know, depression in pregnancy. Okay. So um, this is pretty standard really, we'd be looking for a history of depression, um, significant medical and obstetric problems cause depression as well. But then there's all the psychosocial stuff, okay? And with vulnerable women, you know, there's going to be huge amounts of this. Like we still get people who are sleeping in cars, they're not getting fed well. They're just not coping. OK. Uh, I just wanted to mention screening. We like to use the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. It's not what the uh, Ministry of Health recommends. The Ministry of Health recommends these NICE guidelines. So these come from the UK. So during the past, yeah, these are the questions that you ask, and presumably you know about these and you're asking them at some stage. So during the past month, have you often been bothered by feeling down, depressed or hopeless? Have you often by, been bothered by having little interest or pleasure? Is this something you feel you need or want help with? Okay. The point of this slide is that I always say to women, if I'm talking about medication, that it's only 50% of the treatment. The non-pharmacological stuff is just as important. And so that's having somebody to talk to. Uh, that's getting active and getting some exercise. Sunshine through the eyes in the morning for 20 minutes is actually really important. Um, people do take fish oil. I don't actually want them to take St. John's wort when they're pregnant because it uh, behaves rather like a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which is not great for baby fetus. Um, these are the, just all the antidepressants that, of course, we always use. And the pretty picture just reminds us that uh, we're all susceptible to the placebo effect and that the bright, more brightly coloured, the better they work. Okay, so women always want to know about what are the risks, if you're, 
if we've got somebody who's got a severe illness. So what are the risks of taking this medication during pregnancy? And I always start out with the background risk that all of us um, have to bear every time we get pregnant, which is 2 to 3%. So there's no such thing as zero risk ever. There's no specific algorithm for it. And it's all about balancing risks. Um, we all know now that paroxetine has been uh, uh, made a no-no by the Ministry of Health. So it's really important that if you've got somebody who's on this medication, that they actually have a discussion with you about getting pregnant and that it's not recommended. Okay. There are some women who are best when they're on it, but these are few and far between. Okay. Uh, so there have been... The problem with studies in this area, generally, is that the uh, numbers are small and we end up with... Uh, studies uh, saying different things. Okay, when I'm prescribing to somebody in pregnancy, I have to talk about pulmonary, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. And the important thing is the absolute risk right down there. So with an SSRI, the absolute risk has been looked at to be seven per thousand. Without the medication, it's one to two per thousand. So there is an increased risk of this, but it's not huge. I talk to women and their partners. I think it's really important that the partner is there if you're going to be talking to somebody about taking medication during pregnancy. And I talked about the ductus arteriosus and what this means and how it needs to change at birth and that these medications can slow the clamping down of this. And I talk about uh, birthing in hospital because of the small risk of this, um, that if the baby's going to have uh, problems that you've actually, uh, you're going to have to do something about it. The other important thing that I talk about is the neonatal adaptation syndrome. And um, the important <coughs> word in there is jittery. If this happens, and you have said that there's a possibility that your baby may be jittery, then they'll understand if they find that it happens. <coughs> so these are the figures. 30% versus 10%. OK. Um, and venlafaxine tends to do it too. All right. I've talked about all that stuff. So the NICE guidelines talk about a stepped care approach, so that basically all the stuff that you're going to be doing is recognising it, um, getting women active, looking at what their supports are, There'll be stuff about uh, family violence in there. Okay. And um, then by the time they're moderate to severe, we're going to be talking about medication. And then after that, you're going to be looking at referral. Okay. So it's psychotherapy, psychotherapy. And uh, um, this. So let's move on to lactation. The first line generally is sertraline because there's less than 10% coming through. Okay. Um, fluoxetine is still used a lot. Sometimes we put women on paroxetine for it because that's actually what works well, but you have you have to have an exit strategy from the paroxetine because you don't want them getting pregnant again. Okay. 
So no medication is approved for breastfeeding by the FDA. Okay. No one antidepressant is safer than any others, and there's no algorithm really for it. So the important thing is going to be uh, engaging with the women, talking about the risk-benefit analysis of it all, and uh, getting them and their partner to be okay with what you're doing. So these are the resources about medications in pregnancy and uh, postpartum. The Mother Risk Programme there is uh, from Toronto, and that's where Professor Gideon Corin uh, works, and he's actually a professor of paediatrics, but he also uh, knows a lot about pharmacology as well. Okay, thank you.